real quickly to start the vehicle you put your foot on the brake and hit the power button mm -hmm. And I guess the uh, China market isn't geared toward guys who are 6'3", 6'4". Yeah, four. well, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, unless you're, you know, uh, you know a basketball player, yeah. maybe, but uh, <laughs> like Yao Ming. Once. With that, put it into drive. Okay. Is it possible to run the AC? Yeah, so okay. we can turn on the climate. Let's see, right now oh, we have... Oh, it's all touch, actually. Yeah, right now we have it off, but we can put it on at least eco mode, and if you want me, we can turn it up even some more if you're... If you want to go full yeah. comfort. Infrastructure is the key. No matter what country you're in, it's going to require uh, charging stations readily available. Is that the biggest infrastructure challenge there is? Well, I mean, with the Volt, um, the benefit is that we have the capability of charging this vehicle in the U.S. just based on a regular 110, 120 outlet. Mm -hmm. So unlike a pure battery electric vehicle, um, that really, in most cases, is going to require a 240. You know, mm -hmm. you can charge this vehicle in an acceptable amount of time using 110, 120. And then $500 lets you upgrade, right? Yeah, the, mm -hmm. uh, the hardware um, that we're offering is 490 uh, mm -hmm. for the 240 charge station. Mm -hmm. However, right now, there's a number of DOE, Department of Energy programs, mm -hmm. as well as utility programs that are going to really cover in many cases not only the cost of the charge station but also the installation cost. And are you counting on incentives like that whether it's the US or China to get the market rolling these government incentives to consumers to buy EVs? Um, it's certainly um, as part of initial launch uh, with the new technology mm -hmm. um, like with the Volt well, like with you know advanced lithium-ion batteries but not only the batteries you know all of the new electronic components of this vehicle you know, as any new first generation technology, it is more expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, having incentives, um, whether it's through utilities, through the Department of Energy, definitely help in terms of the early adoption and right. acceptance of these vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, many early adopters will, you know, pay whatever it costs to be first and have this technology, mm -hmm. uh, but it can really push it along into the mainstream. I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, supporting technologies um, or, or new technologies need some support and that's, I think, you know, where, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, incentives are going is to help promote that early adoption and get this to be a mass market product, mm -hmm. you know, getting to those economies of scale, getting to that second generation, you know, where we can start to really drive the cost down and make sure. this, you know, even more affordable. You mentioned the mass market. Uh, you're dealing with rare earths, with natural resources, whether it's lithium or, or nickel. Is there any concern down the road about the, the price of these and that as technology accelerates and production accelerates, so will the prices for these on the open market? Yeah, I mean, it's not my area of expertise in terms of the raw materials, but mm -hmm. certainly, um, you know, we look at all the cost components of this technology. Mm -hmm. um, we look at how battery technology is going to improve in terms of power density mm -hmm. and how that can lower the cost. Um, but certainly if there's particular, you know, raw material supply issues, you know, we, we are looking at all, you know, ways of, of producing batteries and, and maybe even changing, you know, the components and the chemistries mm -hmm. that might lower the cost and hopefully also avoid some of these, what might be, you know, at some point in the future, you know, potentially constraints on supply. On the other side, though, in the next few years, you reach economy of scale. Right. Which means for uh, the pricing, it could go down, or at least it could mean a bigger profit or a more sustainable product for you. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, and, and uh, my colleague George Hansen was showing the fuel cell and sort right. of what the next gen mm -hmm. looks like in terms of um, the size, the weight of, mm -hmm. of uh, the fuel cell stack and the propulsion system. And the same is true here. You know, batteries, the power density is going to improve, so they're going to get smaller, mm -hmm. lighter, uh, more affordable. Um, the capability of the battery cells will increase so mm -hmm. that you, you use fewer cells. All this will help drive down the cost. And then to your point, you know, the economies of scale. Um, you know, we're just at the early, you know, infancy of this of this new technology. Right, right. Um, and with refinement, with design iteration, um, with learning, you know, we've got a very advanced uh, thermal management system, mm -hmm. um, you know, that does add cost to the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but we think right now, because we, this is new, we want to make sure that the uh, that the battery is is well protected. But as we learn, we'll probably find newer ways to keep that battery, you know, well conditioned and mm -hmm. performing, you know, at a lower cost. And then also, with this vehicle, which is baked into the price, we are offering a lot of content. 
We've mm -hmm. got eight airbags. We've got Stabilitrack. We got ABS. We've got five years free OnStar. Mm -hmm. We've got these two seven-inch, you know, LCD screens. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of technology that's built right into the price of this vehicle because we mm -hmm. think, you know, the customers early on that are going to buy this vehicle, it's not just because it's an EV, you know, with extended range capability, but it also has the connectivity mm -hmm. um, and some of the other, you know, features that I think these early adopters, these technology enthusiasts, are also going to want. And the ability to manage and monitor and really have more data around the energy consumption of the vehicle, mm -hmm. um, whether the, while they're in the vehicle or even remotely. So uh, it seems that this is geared, John, more toward a U.S. market where our commutes are a little bit longer. We drive more every day, rather than an urban model that would fit any city across the world. Is that fair to say? Well, no. I mean, this car. I mean, certainly, it, the, the shorter the commute, um, certainly. It's just another reason why you can drive this vehicle without any gas. Mm -hmm. So I think we really see this as meeting the daily commuting, you know, needs of someone who doesn't want to use gas, mm -hmm. but also has that need to go beyond, you know, a short commute for mm -hmm. longer trips, for weekends. Um, and so we do see this as a mainstream car. It can be your only car. Um, you don't have to buy the, you know, the, the urban EV and then also buy, you know, an extended range vehicle. <sighs> right. You, you get right. it all in one. And so we do think. It is that nice blend of vehicle you know, attributes that will meet a lot of the population's basic needs and it can be their only vehicle versus mm -hmm. you know, having two vehicles, one for the weekend trips and one for their urban commute. Mm -hmm. Is price uh, a barrier across the board for every country as you go forward? Um, I mean, certainly price is a key that we're trying to drive uh, to a more mass market, you know, position with this vehicle. Is that tied to the price of batteries in the battery pack? It's tied partially to the battery, but as I said before, this car has a lot of electronic components that are mm -hmm. very early in, from a generational perspective. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's the regen brakes, it's the drive unit, it's the power electronics, mm -hmm. it's all of those things. The battery gets a lot of the attention and it is the most, you know, single most significant, you know, cost to an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. But these other components are equally, especially as you start adding those things up, you know, are equally critical. And a lot of the suppliers I mentioned this morning, you know, they're not used to supplying parts and, and components and systems to the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. You know, the life cycles are less, the demands from a durability and use perspective are, mm -hmm. are different. Um, and so these, you know, these early um, suppliers of this technology are now also learning to supply for the automotive industry. And I think mm -hmm. through their learnings, through design iteration, and through actually more competition, because in some mm -hmm. cases there was, you know, components where you could, you know, you could count on, on a few fingers the number of, you know, capable suppliers. Right, right. Um, and that's changing, and, and I think that's where a lot of, there's also a lot of incentives to support the supply base, mm -hmm. you know, domestically to produce batteries and cells. GM's invested heavily in not only um, um, our own battery lab at mm -hmm. our GM Tech Center to be the world's largest automotive battery lab to test mm -hmm. batteries. Uh, but also, uh, we've taken control over the whole um, uh, manufacturing of, of battery packs. Mm -hmm. um, again, because we have a lot of manufacturing experience that we can bring to this new technology. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the battery manufacturers today don't have that capability for, for an automotive mm -hmm. type of situation. How important is it to have batteries, for the most part, manufactured in the U.S.? Well, I think it's critical. I mean, we don't want to just uh, sort of... Um, you know, transfer, if you will, our reliance on foreign petroleum to mm -hmm. our reliance on foreign batteries right. and foreign technology. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in addition to bringing the battery, you know, development in terms of the testing in our labs, but also the pack, um, we also broke ground earlier this year, um, our supplier did in, in Michigan for a battery cell mm -hmm. plant, uh, again, to start creating not only, you know, American jobs, but also American know-how and, and capability and capacity um, and government involvement has been key in that development, correct? Well, there's certainly been great incentive supported, you know, by the, from a federal and from a state standpoint mm -hmm. to bring this technology uh, to Michigan um, and in, to, you know, the U.S. in general. Uh, because, this, you know, right now, you know, I think you know, there's, there's limited capability today and that's dramatically changing mm -hmm. as more of these new plants come online. But... Um, Coming into development of the of the Volt, and really we had to rely on foreign you know capabilities to, mm -hmm. to develop and, and and launch you know this this vehicle in terms of the battery technology. Right.